Well, so uh, once again, if you're watching from Instagram, go check the link in my bio. Follow along the YouTube live uh, session. It's much better sound quality, much better image quality as well. And um, we can have some fun tonight. And I'm actually really, really excited about today's topic. Um, I want to share with you three, three things that nobody ever taught me. And I want to... I want to share these things with you because I think they are more than essential to be a musician in 2020. And um, first thing is going to be about bass, uh, bass and bass recording. Um, second thing is going to be a mixing topic. And the third thing is actually going to be a songwriting topic with a little twist into some motivation and some, some uh, checklist that I make available for you, uh, which is going to be a bonus tip that you're going to get. And all along these, these topics, you're going to get three bonus tips from me. Um, that I kind of worked out over the years and I want to share them with you. So if you want to follow along on YouTube, uh, right now you're watching from Instagram, go check the link in my bio and follow the YouTube link there. So um, let's jump into the first topic of today. Um, and this is actually a topic about bass. Um, most of you know I'm a bass player mainly, but I'm a singer-songwriter as well. I'm a producer. I do a little bit of mixing as well. Um, so I'm basically doing a lot of things. And um, I've stumbled across this topic um, while being a bass player that also records himself and also mixes himself. So I do mix my own productions. I do uh, mixes for other clients. I do... Um, a lot of stuff with my bass recordings and I also get hired to to record bass a lot so um, I'm basically interested in uh, how to make my sound as perfect as possible um, when I record bass when I send out bass when I uh, record my myself recorded bass um, um, and, and later in the mixing process I don't want to jump into uh, too many problems uh, with my recording so I want to share some principles with you. And um, th this first thing is uh, about dynamics. What means dynamics? Dynamics is if you record a bass guitar, you have natural dynamic differences. Like uh, you have some notes that spike out Maybe it's about your uh, about your playing style. Maybe it's from uh, your instrument. There are just some instruments that have dead points on on the neck, or some some notes that are jumping out. And um, I want to invite you to find out um, with a very practical example that we're gonna um, do together. What I'm gonna do with my bass recording to prevent that. And the first thing that nobody taught me was that in a recording situation, you're not able to play as dynamic um, as in a live situation. Of course, you're able to, but um, the producer, the mixer, the, the um, overall song quality will suffer from um, these issues that you create with a very dynamic playing. So um, let's, let's grab my bass. Grab my bass, let me put that on so you can hear me. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, let me tune my bass. That's the most important thing right now. I adjusted my string action. That's why, like every string was too high right now, but I didn't find the time to to tune in before. Um, so yeah, I wish some some teacher taught me this at some point of my my bass career, um, because I thought 
as soon as I had my first interface, I, I thought I was able to to be a professional recording bass player now. And that is actually not the case. Uh, it wasn't actually not the case uh, back then because I thought I could apply the same principles that I know from life uh, into a recording situation. And there's a good reason why um, a lot of bass players that are very, very known for the studio work are not very... Um, present in a life circumstance. Well, there are some like Nathan East or I don't know, like Leland Sklar or um, what, whoever you you name it, um, Pino Palladino, um, that are very very capable of doing both. But they got something very very right, and this is the number one um, number one thing that I wish uh, somebody taught me earlier. So try to be not as dynamic when recording bass. Why? Well, a couple of reasons. Um, and we, we're gonna figure this out in the DAW in a second. So let me just show you the difference between a very dynamic bass and a very, uh, like, solid bass. Um, I, I'm, what do I mean with solid? I mean solid, uh, solid low end consistency, uh, solid uh, tone consistency. Um, regarding the mid-range um, and yeah let, maybe let's let's focus on that for, um, for um, a moment so let's see if I'm if I'm playing the C right here I'll let me play the D you can hear a lot of bass a lot of low end let me let me pluck the string a little harder you can hear the string rattles a lot all the low end disappears. What happens if I do the same thing? I play a soft open string D. The low end is pretty consistent. Let me pluck the string harder. It, the volume is louder, but the low end disappears. So there's always a sweet spot, uh, as with probably most of the things in the world. Um, there's a sweet spot and um we're as bass players we're um we need to know our instrument that well to know the sweet spot so we need to know how hard we need to uh, pluck the string to hit that sweet spot when we're in a recording situation of course that's very important for live as well but um a live situation is a little more forgiving um i often compare I often compare a bass recording with um, something I learned from a music video shoot from last year. I was part of the production team, um, or, I mean the, the production crew of the James Arthur uh, music video last year um, of the single You. And um, the director said something very interesting and I never was aware of the fact uh, before uh, in acting. So he taught me that... Um, they work with a very, very close up kind of acting. So a little movement goes a very, very long way instead of like a large movement that um, comes from like theater or um, a, a different circumstance. So, or let's say if you're, if you're farther away, you need to act more to have the same impact in the situation. Whereas if you're in a close up situation, like imagine Morgan Freeman doing like a short, you, you know what I mean, right? Um, that goes a very, very long way and has a lot of impact. And same is with recording. So we're actually in a close-up situation. We record um, with a DI box, with a, a direct signal. So how, how much closer could you get to a bass? So, um, and a live situation is usually a little more forgiving. So I compare that to like a more distance kind of acting. So you have a whole different sound. You don't have like a full spectrum of frequencies if you record that um, uh, in a live situation. Whereas if you record a DI, you have the full frequency spectrum. You have a lot, whole bunch of low end, especially with this bass. Um, that's very low and heavy. And um, this is very, very interesting, and nobody ever taught me that of my teachers. Nobody taught me the difference between a live situation and a studio situation. And um, I was completely sure that I'm a 
recording bass player now ever since I got my first interface when I was, I don't know, 17 or so. And I offered my jobs um, to, to record something. But I, I wondered why I didn't get this much jobs as um, as I wanted to. So um, I wish somebody had told me. Um, let's let's do that in a practical situation, okay? So um, let me, let's jump into the door. Okay, here we are in the DAW, and I prepared a little bit for you. Uh, no, we don't use that. And um, just play the groove for you. Very, very simple. And this is going to build up a little bit over uh, over the, the the video. So let me just record something. So first recording I'm going to do is very dynamic, okay? Two. Let me do eight bars. Here we go. One more time. Again, I do a very dynamic recording. Okay, so as you can see, um, okay, to get this point a little clearer, um, I made a mistake. I recorded with a compressor on, so let me just bypass the compressor and do the same thing again. Here we go. Oops, levels too low. Here we go. Okay, so now we got a pretty dynamic recording. I was really quiet at these parts right here. Um, also, I I didn't really right, spike it very crazily. So, um, but let's let's hear it. So you get the idea. It doesn't really sound mixed at all, right? So let me let me find a way to uh, play it at a very consistent level, okay? So here we go. Probably not going to be the very same bass line, but it's, it's going to be comparable. Okay, so this was a little quieter. I played it a little softer overall. So you might have heard it um, from the low end. And well, the low end was a little more consistent. And as you can see, like in the waveform already, this is a very even level. So of course we got some spikes right here, but it's it's very, very... Uh, it's a lot less than in the first recording. So 
Let's compare that. That sounds much more mixed already because it's a consistent kind of low end. It's a consistent uh, sweet spot. It's not always perfect and it's never gonna be always perfect. Um, like most of the best players in the world have some spikes here and there and there's nothing wrong about that. Sometimes you need to go for, for a very dynamic recording. Um, but I'm talking about like um, modern music recording uh, and... The more consistent your tone is, the easier it gets for uh, the mixing engineer to do something great with that and to make your bass uh, very low and heavy, very powerful in the mix. And um, I think that's exactly what we want, right? So um, also be aware of uh, the fact that the position of the um, like the fingerboard, the um, the the plugging hand and the fingerboard hand um, plays a big role in finding a low end and like uh, transparency in the tone so note that if I play this C right here whereas I play this C has a lot more low end whereas this has much more definition so the frequency uh, content develops over the, um, the position of the neck so the farther you get up the neck the more bass heavy um, low end you, you're gonna get from um, from from the tone and that's because um, because you shorten the 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 distance of um, the, the string to the pickups and so this way you get a lot more low end so if, if I play the E over here that has a lot low end if I play it here a lot less low end if I play it here even less low end so take that into consideration if you're recording and um, be aware of the fact that you're going to change your tone uh, with changing your position uh, as well so let's apply some some compression to that so we want to we want to make this very consistent track right here even more consistent and i'm gonna show you in a sec well a compressor i don't know um any compressor will do it so let's go for the 1176 this time from waves uh here we go So, um, let me bounce this. So we can compare the waveforms. So obviously this is now in stereo, but um, you get the idea. Pull it up to comparable loudness so here you can see like we pulled up the very low uh notes from the bass a little bit it's it's a gentle compression so we overall we get a very even bass whereas if we apply some compression over here well, let me do like same volume we need to apply a lot more compression to achieve the same goal here you go Bounce that real quick. Here we go. I <laughs> I applied a lot of compression, and we still we still have some peaks here and there. And overall, the level is consistent, but um, it's it's very very 
hard to handle. Uh, in a track like that, of course, we love the high frequency content that is giving us a lot of attack and a lot of uh, information about the bass notes because it's kind of kind of a funky track. But um, imagine this being the rock track or like a very very gentle bass um, that we need for for the track. So. Um, it's a lot easier to mix and a lot easier to EQ as well. So um, imagine I EQ this very, very dynamic track. So the frequency content changes so much that my, my EQ is um, it's doing something completely different overall. Um, whereas if I play in a very um, consistent way, um, all the EQ moves are going to be audible overall so the the overall sonic content stays the same over the uh, entire track and this is something very very useful in a mixing situation um okay so i wanted to give you a very very cool bonus tip um so let me check this bonus tip number one uh here we go if we if you want to control if you want to control the low end, and let me put my bass away for a sec. This is how we're going to control the low end in a very, very cool way. And I actually took this one from, from Warren Hewitt, who is a wonderful, wonderful educator on YouTube and uh, has wonderful content um, regarding mixing and all that kind of stuff. So you, you should check him out. Produce like a pro. Um, let me change the camera real quick. You should check him out on YouTube. And he has a wonderful approach to control low end in bass. So check this out. Um, I'm going to use this, this consistently recorded bass. Get rid of the other bass. We don't need that anymore. Um, check that out. I duplicate the track. And here's what I'm going to do. Um, I put an EQ on this, a gentle slope, like, I don't know, 12 dB is all right. And I put that about like, I don't know, 250, depending on the base. Um, so, and I copy over this EQ, but I do the opposite. I do a high cut. So what we have now, What we now have is a bass low and a bass high. Together, they still sound pretty much the same. But um, check it out. I want to compress this low end. We don't have any like high end information um, that bothers us to work with the low end here. And he has a very nice approach. So he compresses um the low end quite a lot and you can hear there's a lot of like this woody tone that we like cool and what he does with this upper range bass he compresses that too and there's some spikes in here so I compress a little more a little faster medium attack fastish release there we go and I combine those two tracks into a bus go track that's base group so and what else let's distort and let's treat let's treat this upper range bass as if it was my amp track and this is just a two track recorded di signal right here um so let me pull up a, a distortion a little bit of distortion or saturation whatever you want to call it <laughs> I love the Neve. Oh 
Okay, so what I can do now is I can mix those two together. Got some phase issues, so let me do a little steeper. That's cool. So what I'm going to do now is I want to take a multiband compressor and I want to control the low end itself. So I just want to compress this part, put it up to like 200. Let me go a little deeper here. So what I do I want the low end to be very consistent. So the the lower notes, the lower notes need to be pulled up and the high volume notes should be turned down. So this is a very consistent low end. After that because because a good thing if you do that before an EQ before an EQ in the bass group you can actually have a very consistent level going into the EQ and it stays very consistent and like any EQ move that you make stays very consistent um, so I don't know like maybe I would do um, something like a Neve style EQ <clears throat> if it works here we go uh, let me take a Neve style EQ because I love him it's a little nasty right here add some presence a little bit of low end and I like to boost it right here a little bit I need a cut That is a very cool consistent low end in the mix so I could even uh, go ahead and do something like a parallel processing and I like this MV2 from Waves right here because it does the work for you you don't have to send it to an extra bus you can actually um, uh, separate the low end have this parallel compressed to death <laughs> You can also parallel compress the high content. Pull down the volume a bit. All right, 
that's cool, right? Uh, so that was bonus tip number one. Boom. Um, cool. So I hope you you like this first topic of the day. And let's go ahead and jump to topic number two. Um, I wish somebody taught me this earlier. Um, and this is a mixing topic as well. Um, because nobody ever taught me that a high pass uh, that a low pass filter is just as important as a low pass filter what does it mean like um some people of you might call it high cut and low cut so high cut is equally important as a low cut um and why is that so because you rarely have any situation where you uh, sit very very close to an instrument um, so you can hear like all the high frequency content um, other than the voice usually or like a acoustic guitar in a living room concert or whatever or if um, your your spouse is uh, sitting right in front of you and playing some some nice guitar for you um, so that's like the only situations we really hear very very high frequency content talking about um, I don't know like uh, five six seven eight nine ten k and upwards um other than that we hear a um an impression of the direct sound mixed with the room sound that is be pl being played in so imagine a rock concert if you uh wouldn't have uh, if you didn't have like any pa system uh, you would hear no high frequency content at all we put the mics very close to the amplifiers so we can have actually a a good representation of the frequency spectrum that the guitar is creating but what we do is we do a high pass filter we do a low pass filter as well um, because we need this spot in the frequency spectrum for stuff like vocals or maybe like the strum noise of a guitar to poke through a mix um, but that's it basically so we are actually looking for a natural sound and um, the one thing i didn't learn from anybody is that low passing is equally important um let's take an example on that right um let me pull up a mic for my acoustic guitar real quick And of course, same principle right here. Uh, the more consistent your recording is, the better you're gonna be able to mix it. So I'm gonna take this riff that I can, came up with um, on another live stream. So let me record this real quick. Okay, so this is strummed guitar part. Let's dive into that. Okay, so here we go. Let's hear the recording. And by the way, I used a Rode NT5 for that, just because it's a very cool mic for this budget and it it's very easy to use. So I just plucked it into my, my Apollo and used the uh, cleanest preamp, like the current preamp. Okay, 
so. I recorded, I recorded this acoustic guitar and um, I want to show you real quick. Switch to my camera. Here we go. Um, I want to show you how I recorded this uh, acoustic guitar um, because that's a major topic for itself, right? But I used like a mono microphone, um, only one source. I do record with a stereo um, mic setup as well, but most of the times I use a mono mic setup because it's easier and faster. But uh, I want to show you where I positioned the mic. This guitar right here, this guitar right here sounds very, very nice. And um, I don't really often point um, the the mic to like the 12th to 15th, 14th fret, uh, as most people do. I do point the microphone to this spot of the guitar, this point right here, because this guitar sounds very, very top endy so um i want to have a cool representation of the body sound as well um, and this comes from broadcasting uh most broadcasters uh use that position for for micing their acoustic guitars and when they got an artist uh doing live sessions in a in a show um it it's just a very very natural sound and uh i wish somebody told me that earlier uh because i was i was trying all kinds of stuff, um, pointing to 12th fret, tw pointing to 14th fret. Um, it all worked fine, but not as good as this. So, and of course, like every guitar is very different from each other. Um, the position of the mic is one, one major step to a very good guitar sound. The second step is choice of microphone. Um, so, as I said, I used the uh, very inexpensive Rode NT5 to create that um, guitar track right now. I sometimes use this SM81, I sometimes use a Neumann uh, U87 or uh, the K184s, um, all kinds of different sounds. And it's always a question uh, of how you want it to sound. If you want it to be very, very top endy you should definitely go for a condenser mic. Um, but what I want to show you now is a how we can make this sound very natural. I used a very close micing position. So we have a very uh, over-exaggerated uh, picture of the high frequency content because it was, imagine imagine you you listen to a guitar like this. So you would have the same uh, high frequency content that this microphone just put up or this microphone um, so you're never going to listen to an acoustic guitar like that right so you want it to sound a little more natural and here's a way to do that with a low pass filter and i don't necessarily say that that the recording is very very bothering in the high frequency content but um at the same time, it's not supernatural. And again, if this is something you're looking for, it's totally fine. But as soon as you bring in some vocals, maybe some some keys, you have areas of conflict in in the frequency spectrum, and um, the high end frequency uh, um, content can be very very annoying because our ear is so sensitive in that that field so imagine like we have a whole bunch of guitars recorded we have a lead singer we have a background vocal we have an organ and piano whatever um, we have a percussion loop so all of that happens in the same frequency area and um, we want to avoid like too much of conflict situations um, if uh, uh, so we can do that with low pass filtering so check it out um, as I said very close representation full spectrum so let's see what happens if I turn down the high pass, uh, low pass filter
pull a very gentle slope and I low pass it a little bit too because you, you can hear it, it's, it's a little boomy because it, it's picking up so much from the sound hole. Um, so let's first get rid of the boominess. So the low end sounds pretty natural now. Let's say you're listening to a guitar player that's like, I don't know, three or four meters away. That's still a very possible natural representation of the guitar. But the top end is very, very close, right? So we want to tim that down a little bit. That's pretty natural. Let's bypass it. So once again, um, if you don't low pass, it, it has a lot of nice shimmer to it. And if you, um, if the guitar is like the main instrument in that, in that circumstance that's totally fine because there's no other element that's um in conflict with this with this uh guitar so we can leave a lot of that in which is a very beautiful sound don't get me wrong but in a mixing situation we want to reserve that kind of area of the frequency field for stuff like vocals and um maybe some more important um elements of the song so keep in mind Low passing is a very good thing, just like high passing. You can make up space for uh, for elements that need to be shiny, to need to be shimmery on a top, uh, just like vocals, for example. Um, so let's play that in the band. Low pass. As you can hear, there's already a conflict between the percussions that are in the same frequency spectrum right above, like, I don't know, like 10k or so, um, where uh, the, the strummed guitar is very present as well if I don't low pass. So if I do low pass i can reserve another spot for the guitar to be shining so let's exaggerate a area of the frequency spectrum where the guitar actually sounds very beautiful and warm and um very pleasing so check it out the boost with the boost I exaggerated So what I did, I, I boosted this acoustic guitar in a very very uh, broad scope um, in an area where the guitar actually sounds very, very warm and and nice and uh, and very, very nice to listen to, um, and again with this low pass that I did, um, I solved any any issue and any conflict uh, potential between the percussions and the strumming sound of the guitar. Um, again, 
this can be very very useful if we want uh, to to have a rhythm guitar like it, for instance we, we doubled this guitar and uh, we wanted to spread it out very far so we need that that kind of strumming noise to to poke through um, uh, all the other instruments but in this situation, I think it's a very good thing to do a low pass filter because we leave some space for the percussion. We can boost another frequency that we maybe like even better um, in, in this acoustic part. Um, and we are not having any conflicts with other elements. So check it out one more time. There's a little bit of conflict uh, between the bass and, and the guitar as well, um, because it's a little boomy, so maybe we can get rid of that too. Now that I cleaned that up, I can compress it very easily. Uh, let's just take, uh, why not take another 1176 again? So here we go. Get rid of some of the dynamics, just a little bit. Fastish release. Slow attack. I want all the transients to go through. Now that's a very good representation of the of the guitar right and we did some low pass and i think that's very very natural right so here is um here is bonus tip number two um for recording and or yeah here we go bonus tip number two um sometimes it's very useful if you record with a lot of top end that you can filter out. Um, especially in a situation like that, I might have also recorded it with a little more top end. How can you achieve that? In, record, in recording acoustic guitars, you can achieve that uh, kind of brilliant top end if you uh, point the microphone up to the 12th fret or the 14th, 15th fret, you can check that out. And this brings in a lot more top end. And I want to show you in a second. Just the difference between um, the position that I recorded earlier. Like, remember? Position down here. Right at the bottom of the body. Let me just re record a couple bars of the guitar pointed to the 12th fret. And I'm going to apply the very same treatment uh, uh, of processing to the guitar, and we're going to see what happens. I distance I use is about I don't know, like twenty centimeters, twenty to thirty. Don't know what that is in inches. Never, never got that. <laughs> but you can look it up. So here we go. That's a top Andy recording. Okay, let's listen to that. As you can see, 
as you can see in the waveform already, because we chose a um, a lighter kind of recording position, we also have a little less volume because we don't pick up as much from the sound hole, which brings us this much volume. So I just want to bring it up with clip gain so I can use the same processing and we're going to be able to compare the two of them. So check it out. So this is very shiny, right? Let me bypass the logins. That was our first recording. A little warmer. A little mid heavier. Whereas... Very silky. It's very, very nice. So, and the beauty, the beauty in that is if you combine the two of them, you have, um, and let's say this is a rhythm guitar part, let's, let's pan them hard left, hard right. Now you have a wonderful representation of a guitar. Check it out. Right, that's beautiful. It sounds very, very wide. It's um, it's silky. It's cool. And if you use that as a rhythm guitar part, this is just very, very beautiful thing to do. Um, if you wanna, if you wanna exaggerate the the strumming noise, it's totally fine to put your low pass a little higher. But same thing, make the guitar sound as pleasing as possible, and you can really really easily achieve that with a low pass filter so that's my tip number two and the topic number two all right so let's get rid of the bonus tip the last the last thing i want to share with you today and i need to look at my my cheat sheet right here because um this is going to be a little philosophic just a little bit um don't worry but i wanted to share this with you because I think it's a very important topic. Um, my topic is there are no rules. There are no rules. So everything I told you, forget about it. Maybe it doesn't work for you. Maybe it does work for you. This is just something that I came up with. And um, there's literally no no rules in, in songwriting. There's no rules in production. And I want to encourage you to break the rules. So um, our system is somehow built on a learning approach that means we need to learn everything about everything. And uh, we need to be experts of any any part of what we learn. So we're actually specialists are, um, I don't know, uh, let's uh, let's say our school system or like our our approach on learning an instrument. How do you learn an instrument? You're not learning an instrument by just grabbing an acoustic guitar and figure out how to play Highway to Hell. You probably don't, right? You probably go to a music school. You probably look for a teacher, which is a great thing to do. But the teacher is going to teach you everything there's to know yeah he's going to teach you about barre he's going to teach you about a, a about a minor uh, all the fancy chords that you can play and that's totally fine he's going to teach you all about scales he's going to teach you all about strumming and uh, plugging and all this kind of stuff but let me tell you something most of the people that you admire um and I know this from, from my own experience because I got to know so many, many, many great musicians that I look up to. And um, they all have one thing in common. They're down, bone down specialists about their thing. Um, they figured out how they translate the information that they got in their head into inspiration on the instrument or on their voice 
on their songs. So songwriting is also a part of that. Um, and I can't encourage you enough to just look for a different, maybe a different kind of approach of learning some time. Uh, I don't say there's anything wrong with the classical approach of learning everything and then sort out what you want to learn. Um, but what worked best for me in, in the past, I want to be very, very honest with you, is if I had a clear purpose um, about the stuff I wanted to learn. So I think that's even more important to uh, to have that instead of trying to learn everything there is about a bass guitar. I don't want to... For, for instance, I don't want to be a slap bass guitarist. I do slap from time to time, but I never really took the time to learn, um, to learn all the crazy triplets, all the uh, the crazy techniques out there. Because I figured out I'm never gonna be a slap guitar bass guitarist. Although I like the sound from time to time, and then I use it for the purpose of my songs. I always want to have my my bass lines to be fitting my song so that's my purpose and that's the purpose how i learned bass in the first place um i for instance didn't go to a music school straight, straight away didn't look for a teacher right away um i was looking for um a possibility to uh transport information that I know from my favorite recordings and somehow figure them out on, on my, my fingerboard and play them no matter what, right? And um, I, I really, really want to stress this out um, because expert level and being a specialist is, is a very, very cool thing um, because uh, I think... I think it's it's very cool if you if you know a lot of stuff but actually when i look back most of the stuff i needed to learn how to forget it in order to be creative again so because your intuition drives you towards a uh, songwriting goal a a recording goal a melody a lyric and um there's so much stuff to learn and these are all tools right so Actually, you should use those tools from the classical approach if you run into a obstacle, an obstacle that holds you back from realizing what you actually wanted to accomplish. So my, my very, very big advice is uh, follow your intuition, follow um, the processes that bring you joy um, and enjoy the fun of the process because if you... Listen to your inner feel very carefully and you actually end up to need um, to motivate yourself to to pick up the bass and, and just figure something out that gets stuck in your head. Then you maybe you, you don't want it as much as you want, uh, as you thought you wanted it. Um, so this is my, my very important advice. And listen carefully and be honest with yourself. Um, so, and the problem is, and why I'm not mad at any teacher that didn't um, teach me how to do these things, because these principles don't, they are not a, a common thing to do. So you need to figure them out and you need to figure out a known uh, approach to, to um, listen to your inner self if, if you... Um, try to realize a project, try to realize a baseline, whatever. Um, and all I wanted to do is encourage you to find uh, the time to actually um, take that into cons consideration that uh, you, you, you feel right and you enjoy the process. So, um, and I got a bonus tip for you here too. Um, just pull up the bonus tip number three. Boom. Um, I'm sending you a checklist that you can download. There's a link in the description below. Um, and in this checklist, there is like a um, step-by-step -step plan that you can follow 
that I follow um, on every project that I do um, in order to find out how I accomplish something. So the first thing you need to do is imagine the exact thing and project that you want to accomplish or realize. Second step is find five, and I took this from from, uh, the best educator in motivation, in my opinion, Brenton Bouchard, uh, from his High Performance Habits. Uh, he's saying that take find find uh, five major steps um, that you need to make if you want to achieve a goal or um, uh, a, a project that you want to realize, and follow along these five steps, just like a checklist itself, including all the minor steps that are um, that are applied to any of the major steps. So um, try to to put down like anything you can um, regarding one step and, and put them in the right order, uh, put them in the right category of your steps and and so on and so forth. Um, and then set an appropriate scope of time for any of the, uh, for every individual step, like deadlines to raise necessity towards yourself. Let's give you, let me give you an example of um, maybe a song. So let's say I'm a musician, I want to write a song, I want to publish a song. What five major steps are included there? So first, write a good song in the most basic way. means harmony, melody, and if you have, or if you are a singer, a lyric, right? Until you finish that, none of the other steps that are uh, are going to go after that are going to matter because... That's the most important step, step number one. So then when you finish writing the song, go to step number two. Step number two, produce, record the song. Uh, number three, mixing, mastering, cover art. And again, don't do anything um, in between. So just follow along these steps because they make sense and they go along with all the minor steps that are part of this. So mixing, you need to find a mixing engineer, you need a master engineer, you need maybe a designer to to design cover art for you. Uh, maybe you can do it yourself. So you can actually save some money and some, some time. But um, most of the time you need to do research, you need to do uh, communication, all that kind of stuff. And these are minor steps included in like the five major steps. Uh, Step number four, distribution. So upload your song, set a release date, um, and tell uh, start telling all your friends about it. So maybe they can they can uh, contribute in in some way um, of the distribution factor. Maybe they can sell CDs. Maybe somebody uh, has a shop online, so that you can actually set up like an online shop already. Um, all that happens with distribution. And number five promote your song right so produce trailers um send out in send out information about the song on email list social media uh do playlist pitching all that kind of stuff so there you got it five steps um from a writing a song to a finished product and i think knowing five major steps is a very very nice thing um, to have yourself and your mind organized if you want to accomplish a creative project. But you can you can set these set steps to any project that you want to accomplish. And you just need to be thinking about all the steps that are involved in this process. So um, this is my, my bonus tip. Go down to the description and download the cheat sheet. There's the checklist for uh, accomplishing a project or a goal. And um, there's also like this example um, of a song uh, written down for you to follow along with that. Cool. So there you have it. Three tips of a very, uh, um, very different origin. But uh, I think it's very important to to know these kind of things as a 2020 musician. Um, uh, First step... um, our first topic was bass recording, recording in general. Uh, we talked about dynamics. We talked about bass recordings. And I wish somebody taught me that I need to be consistent when recording. More consistent that I need to be in a life circumstance. Um, number two was high cut is, or low pass filter is just equally as important as a high pass filter or a low cut. Um, I wish somebody taught me that because... 
Um, I always thought everything needed to be very shiny, every very exaggerated, very um, present, but that is not a case for a good mix. We have a clear separation between frequencies and we definitely uh, be able to figure out, uh, we are able to figure out which elements of the song are the most present and the most spiking and the most um, most important at this moment of time right so and the third topic that we had was there are no rules so break them wherever you can learn to forget what you've learned um, take it in your system if you there's nothing wrong with classical learning approach but take it into consideration um, to learn with more purpose so imagine what you want to accomplish and figure out the steps that you need to make to accomplish this goal and figure them out individually. D divide those those steps into five major steps with all the minor steps that are included in those steps. Um, and you're gonna figure out a way how to learn the, st uh, the stuff necessary to accomplish each and every one of those steps. So I think um, I'm gonna close this live stream for today. I hope this was helpful information. It was a lot of information, I know, but I love doing this live. And um, as you can see, this is the most real format uh, of all. So I hope you enjoyed this. I did enjoy it a lot as usual. And I want to close today's live stream with the wonderful, the awesome, Benny's live stream jingle. It's Benny, Benny, Benny's live stream. <laughs>